the time rate of change of the magnetic field. So this was the new quantity that was introduced by having time variation involved. And similarly for the magnetic field, magnetic field is fully defined by, first of all, a, a divergence. And it's the divergence of the B field, so we've got the inner vector product of two vectors. And so far, it may turn out to be wrong tomorrow, but so far, experimentally, we've no evidence of magnetic monopoles. So this remained true for both statics and dynamics. So just to emphasize from Maxwell's equations, both E is a function of time, and now B is a function of time. That's the essential change we've made from going from statics to dynamics, as the name implies. Our curl, the curl of the B field, in statics, we formally had that it was proportional to the surface current density. And this was amperes per unit area, millimeter squared, centimeter squared, whatever. And we had a factor of 4 pi that again was a result of experiment. Notice that the curl of a vector field, remember that curl can only be applied to a vector field, generates another vector field. Consequently, the current density is a vector. The additional term was to introduce a factor that involved the time rate of change of the electric field. So this was the new quantity introduced by having time variability, just as we had this quantity introduced because of time variability. So you can notice the symmetry here. The whole idea was that as soon as you made E or B time varying, they instantly generated the other field. It brought it into existence. If you've got a, a charge and it's stationary, as soon as you wiggle the charge, it will radiate and create the B field. And that's what's being stated there. They're called microscopic. Perhaps it's um, a bit of a, an unhelpful thing to say, but in the literature, nonetheless, you will sometimes see these equations, which only involve E and B, to be the thing that holds true if you're within the space of an atom, say, or if you go into outer space where nominally there's nothing. So there's a planet, outer space, the sun moved further out. So that in deep space, intrinsically, you have no material, no matter, no stuff. And that's what they essentially mean by free space. It's free of material. And under those circumstances, these equations only hold true. Once you leave the space between the nucleus of an atom and the electron and go further out and move up from the microscopic scale or even the intergalactic scale, but you come to the so-called macro scale. Macro simply means on our scale, something of the order of a meter. So you can talk about maybe a tenth of a meter or a few tens of meters. That's the macro scale. And on that scale, we're dealing with material, concrete, bricks, windows, flesh, substance. And in that case, these equations are no longer sufficient. So this, this lecture is about how we have to modify these equations to take account of the fact that the real universe is made up of stuff of whatever kind. Stuff that has intrinsic electric response and magnetic response. So we go to consider what's called uh, a macro. Scopic. Maxwell equations. And we'll first of all look at the, the situation for the electric field. So, so far we've had the divergence of the electric field is equal to 4 pi rho. But 
that as soon as you introduce material, material media, whatever you like, what happens is that the divergence of the electric field now takes on uh, a new form. the asterisk there. Okay, so here we had, this is the, the micro form that we had before, so we can probably just emphasize this is the micro case. And then this is now going to be the so-called macro. The principal change, here's our applied field. The field, the electric field, sees some material and induces a response, an electric response in the material. It says that there's a certain amount of charge density that we have direct knowledge of. That is, we can see it or measure it on the surface of the material. What we don't have direct experimental access to is the induced charge density. So the IND subscript there means induced. This is something we don't have direct experimental knowledge or control over. And essentially, it's, it's an admission of complete ignorance about the result of the fact that we've impressed an electric field upon it. So I'll just sit here that uh, rho in is rho induced. You can see here that the induced volume charge density is a function of the applied electric field. Now because it's unhelpful really not to have any direct handle on this new induced charge, what we try to do is see if we can turn this equation back into a form like this, where we did have total control over what was happening. And so what we do is to, if we can, turn this term here into some sort of divergence expression. Just in the same way as this volume charge density was the result of a divergence on a field, let's see if we can convert this unknown quantity into a field-like term that we can bring back onto this left-hand side, leaving on the right-hand side the universe we do know about, the volume charge that we do know about. And this is the beginning of where we define what you may have read about in your lecture notes, if you've gone ahead and uh, read them, of the displacement, the electric displacement uh, field, D. And essentially, it's a, a complete fabrication. But the electric displacement field says we've got no knowledge of the induced charge, and it's a, it's a, a pseudo vector, a pseudo field. It's, it's not the real field in the same way that the electric field is. So, just to make a note, we've no direct, and that's the key thing, there's no direct experimental knowledge. to reformulate
therefore, what we can do is to have our divergence of the electric field And what we'll do is we'll take this term here and we'll stick it onto the left-hand side. So we, we subtract from the right-hand side the induced charge, so we've got the 4 pi rho induced equal to what we do have experimental control and knowledge of. 